So the Crusaders, this season's Super Rugby champions, 25-17 over the Lions. Still the only side to win a title offshore. Mertz was part of that win over the Brumbies in Canberra in 2000. As you said, eight titles now, the most successful Super Rugby team in history. Scott Robinson won four as a player, now one as a coach in his first year. Is it the start of a, a new era or a, a new dynasty? Well, certainly hoping so. And, um, you know, he's, he's stayed true to what his values have been in coaching the Canterbury Provincial Rugby team as well, uh, which he was involved in a number of titles there. He's just, you know, he's an ebullient character. There's no escaping the hard work from this group, but they also enjoy their footy. They've got tremendous heart and, uh, and they have fun. And that's a huge part of it. It's been a good story because he's also been involved in New Zealand under 20. So, you know, it's something that we need to look at is tracking our coaches and progressing them from playing days through the provincial levels into super rugby levels. And he can clearly coach. Um, oh, it's not his coaching that we're talking about. It's, he can dance, Nick. The guy can move. Like, he does this after every tournament he wins as a coach. He's getting better. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mertz's move. He's copied it. Off. He's stolen it. He gets better. Wait for it. Yeah. That's it. Oh, I'd love yeah. to see some of the coaches in Australian history do that. John Connolly, Ewan yeah. McKenzie, I reckon they could pull that stuff off. Take it to the deck. It's well, beautiful, isn't it? He's been practising all week, hasn't he? You don't just pull that out <laughs> and nail it like that. That's, that's phenomenal. What is it that um, is the difference between Todd Blackadder, who had essentially the same side... Tight and... hips, you can't move very <laughs> <laughs> Not as much of a dancer. And, and Scott Robinson. Look, I don't know. I mean, you know, Todd's been a huge part of Crusaders rugby and um, I think uh, to a little... Uh, to a certain extent this year, the, the Crusaders flew under the radar a little bit from the start. Once, once they started getting up around nine, ten wins in a row, obviously teams started lining them up. But, you know, they, they came in, they got to do their work. They weren't one of the fancy teams right at the start. Um, that, that has helped. But, yeah, I just think it's the evolution of, of kind of the modern environment and it works uh, at this level. I don't know if necessarily you'd take that kind of atmosphere into test level. But, uh, you know, the proof's in the pudding, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, look, they set a standard during the season which was so incredible and... To go through, what, only one loss the whole season? Like, that's just incredible in its own right, let alone the win overseas. So pretty impressive stuff from the Crusaders. Kate, what did you make of the Cocker Smith uh, red card and obviously down to 14 men uh, early in that first half? And did it make a big difference, do you think, to the game? It always makes a, a difference when you lose a player for that long a period of time. Look, in, in, in any game of rugby, that's a red card. And, and what's Cocker Smith doing? That's the thing that I can't get over. I'm thinking, what are you doing? Why do you get yourself in that position? There was lots of time. The ball was up there for a long period of time. He just completely misjudges oh. it. But I mean, a player of his standard, Mate, Shep, shouldn't I couldn't agree that. more. That, I like talking about rugby IQ, and I just think that is one of the oh. stupidest things I've ever seen. <laughs> Not only in the occasion of the game, you've, you've got a chance to win a Super Rugby title. He makes no effort to look at the ball. He's got a player in front of him, six feet in the air, doesn't even try to avoid him, takes him straight out. It's got to be a red card. Oh, I reckon and now, that... thankfully, he's got to live for the rest of his life knowing he blew oh, a I know it's against the law, and the law say that is a red card, but I think that there's got to be some type of... Um, you know, no, rules are black and white. In big games, and we heard the coach after the game talk about you'd love to be able to yellow card him and look at a five, six week suspension. Like, he just got it wrong. There was no malicious intent there. I, I don't but he agree. Got it wrong. I, I absolutely don't agree. I think there is malicious intent. And, and a lot of people have compared saying, well, he didn't punch him in the head. But you tell me the difference between. That was me. Punching that was me earlier someone. saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You tell me the difference between punching someone in the head that's not even paying attention. He got, he got hipped in the head. He and got then himself smashed. <laughs> running at someone wrong. who's six feet in the air, completely unable to defend themselves while they're watching the ball. And then they come down on their own head. But, but so he's he could not, have broken him. He's not neck. six feet in the air until a split but... second before he gets there. That's the problem. And he, he kind of braced himself. He knew he got it wrong. It's not like he clipped his arm, his legs in the air. Yeah. I think anyone smart enough know, would have known that the Crusaders player was going to jump for the ball and then you've got to be safe. It's his duty of care to take care of a player Correct. in the air. I was, I was kind of gutted for him at the time. I, I was hoping for a yellow only, to be honest, because, you know, part of it's the spectacle. I think that's one of the arguments as well. But... Part of it, I, I just, I'm uncomfortable with the end result being so much a driver of the punishment because, you know, they can fall so many different ways. David Havili might have fallen completely differently and almost landed on his feet well, and if he from did, the same action and, and it wouldn't, and it wouldn't have, been, have been a red yeah, card. Yeah. So I just don't see kind of the logic in that. And, and I think some, some of these occasions you slow the pictures down mm. into that 
incredible slow-mo from these incredible camera operators that Fox and Sky and these sort of amazing broadcasters use these days. Um, and you slow it right down, it looks awful. But when you see it in real time, you, I think you've got to add a little bit of context, actually, to, to, to that sort of process. What about the way they, they fought back? I mean, if it had gone another 10 minutes or so, you, you had the feeling that, that maybe the Lions might have got there. Yeah, it was sensational, wasn't it? The hometown, despite the red card, got behind them. And they showed, really, the class that got them to the final to begin with. This was... Uh, a great try as they end up uh, working towards the line here. Um, and, you know, they had a chance to win the game. And I think with 15, it could have been a very different story. But uh, that was the reality of the situation that they faced for it. And unfortunately, it just wasn't enough, was it? Shows how good they are as a team, though. Scott Robertson mm. knew that they needed to get points early because he knew that 15, 20 minutes to go, that's the stro line's strongest period. And it's not even necessarily the, the altitude affecting other teams. It's, it's the strength of this Lions team. And, and they came back and against it, what's been an incredible scrambling defence for the Crusaders, they still put them to the sword a couple of times when they really wanted to. You talk about them having chances to win in a couple of key moments at the line-out when uh, the Lions got turned over on their own throw. I mean, all season, the Crusaders have been outstanding, but in the heat of the moment here in a final, late in a final, and they come up with these sort of steals. Yeah, in years gone by, the Crusaders aren't a side that have been known for their line-out. They've always been a good scrum and their line-out's got by, but the last three or four years, it's been a real strength of theirs. And it just shows the class of a, and, and a side that's been well coached. Look at Whitelock, he's often looking at the hooker. He's tracking without having to turn his head away from the hooker. So it's really, really good to watch a side uh, execute in big games. And, and that's no surprise that the Kiwis are you know, one of the best line-outs in the world because a lot of their players come from that team.